Today, we're going to be covering the case of Rebecca Grossman, who is facing a murder trial currently for what the prosecution considers simply speed, given the reason that lives were lost the fateful day of September 29th of 2020. Two young boys, 11-year-old Mark and his 8-year-old brother, Jacob, were hit by a vehicle and their lives were taken. But not just any vehicle. This was allegedly social light Rebecca Grossman's vehicle, a Mercedes-Benz SUV, at the hands of a plastic surgeon's wife and a seemingly wonderful woman who stands behind her foundation to help others called the Grossman Burn Foundation. But defense for Rebecca say, it wasn't her. We do, however, see here her vehicle in the front, crushed within the hood and the grill of the vehicle she was driving that night. One thing's for sure, two beloved children were tragically killed, brutally. Someone will have to be held accountable. The trial is going to determine just who that is. We will be going over that today. If you're new here, welcome. Be sure to check out my podcast on Apple and Spotify called Crime Light the Podcast. For returning family, welcome back. I'm Chelsea J. This is Crime Light. September 29th of 2020, the world was beginning to shift back open from the nationwide pandemic. Most everyone had been on lockdown during the deadly coronavirus. I worked the whole time, so I don't know what that was like, but I do remember that the rumors were true. There wasn't much toilet paper left. Jokes or not, you got to know your neighbors pretty well when it came to small favors. Hey, you got an egg? How about some toilet paper? Anyway, September in California is recalled to have been a very warm time in 2020 within Los Angeles. LA, they call it, Los Angeles, California, out here features palm trees and a large city with many different locations that you could social distance in order to regain your social life back just to get out of the house that you'd been living in for too long during the lockdown. Rebecca Grossman on September 29th of 2020 decided to go out meet a male companion or two and enjoy a cocktail at Julio's Agave Grill. For the Iskanders, they were a family of six who decided to take their four young children out for a family evening stroll in the hour of 7 p.m. Nancy would be the mother of the two victims and she reflected on that evening. She said, I saw two cars coming toward us in an insane, crazy speed. She continued, I am 100% sure that I myself was in the crosswalk with all my children. Though it was the evening, it was still light at the time outdoors. I could clearly see two cars, black and white, and they could see me too. Nancy put her hand up in the air and jumped with her five-year-old son and a jumped out of the way of the black SUV without that vehicle hitting anyone. Suddenly, she heard a lot of noise and the sound of a crash when the white SUV passed. She said, I did not see the white SUV hit my boys. I just heard the crash. And at that, she remembers, none of the vehicles stopped. She said, at first I couldn't find them. I was screaming, I was in shock, I didn't know what to do. As she searched around the crosswalk and the road, she first found Jacob laying near her. Jacob had been thrown 50 feet from the crosswalk of the accident. Then she found Mark, with blood coming out of his mouth. Mark had been thrown 254 feet. A football field is 360 feet, so just imagine how far that really is. She said every bone in Mark's body was broken, and I knew he died. I knew Mark had died. Her boys died there that warm September evening right in front of their family in front of their mother. The two boys, Mark and Jacob, are buried within a cemetery instead of having the rest of their lives to be whoever they were destined to be. There was a man singing in the shower. And mom came in and gave him a flower. Then she, then she he said, your girlfriend dumped you. But don't worry, of course I'll date you. Leaving their family in agony and grieving alongside the two youngest children now 
to only have each other as siblings. The family has now spent four Christmases without them. They've had to pass by every Valentine's Day buying one set of Valentine's Day cards for their one child or maybe by now two. They mourn two birthdays a year. And if they leave their home as a family, each reservation will now be for four people, not six. And we don't know what it's like to walk outside anymore. To cross the street now, to see a Mercedes-Benz SUV, to pass a courthouse or a cemetery. But they do. They're reminded each and every time they face life itself. Rebecca Grossman is standing trial right now for their murder, but is fighting to not be convicted because she doesn't believe that she is responsible for this tragedy. Rebecca's charges include two counts of second-degree murder, two counts of vehicular manslaughter with gross negligence, and one count of hit-and-run driving resulting in death in connection with the collision. When you hear about her choices and what she was doing that evening leading up to the two boys' death, you're probably going to think to yourself, how dare you? Both Rebecca and the male companion have had attorneys fighting for the who done it right, saying, it wasn't my client. Well, let's just sprinkle in the twisted details of why this case is just that much more bizarre. Starting with 60-year-old Rebecca Grossman, she is an American woman who is a Californian socialite, owner and chairman of the Grossburn Foundation. Besides that really big movement, she previously has worked as a publisher in Westlake Village and an editor for Powerhouse Lux Media. Likewise, the multi-talented Rebecca also served as a guest host for the weekly morning show Stop the Clock alongside news journalist Ellen Leva. Rebecca Grossman is well recognized for being the wife of Dr. Peter Grossman, a famous American plastic surgeon. Dr. Peter H. Grossman, president of the Los Angeles Society of Plastic Surgeons, is a board certified plastic surgeon whose private medical practice is divided between cosmetics and reconstructive surgery in West Hills, California. Now, this isn't about him, but this guy is a big deal. He has worked very hard all his life to achieve everything that he has. And now, if you look up his name, he is no longer only affiliated with his academic awards, with his achievements, with helping patients achieve desired results as his clients. He is actually a very highly rated doctor who is now tagged in this huge crime that his wife has been involved in. It's just, it's crazy. But crazier than that comes the male companion that Rebecca met with the night of the tragedy. The black Mercedes SUV that she's up against in court, in her own trial, of course. Well, that was the vehicle of her boyfriend, Scott Erickson, who was 56 years old, an American former Major League Baseball pitcher. This guy's pretty big too. He played for some of the biggest leagues of all time, such as the Los Angeles Dodgers, the New York Yankees, just to name a few. He was a member of the 1991 World Series champion twins. In late 2000, Scott Erickson was also featured in People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People edition. Now, he had a prior run-in with the law. He ended up marrying a woman by the name of Lisa Guerrero. But prior to their marriage, he actually ended up arrested for second-degree assault after an argument, and the charges were held against him, but then eventually they were dropped. Allegedly, they were arguing pretty bad. Uh, it leaked out into the hallway. It was in the public eye, and that was kind of that. Personally, I already have questions about this guy. I think it's really weird that he was supposed to be going down for second-degree battery, and suddenly they dropped the charges, and Lisa married him, and now they got, you know, divorced. I don't know. It's kind of a familiar story to those kind of people that have narcissistic tendencies, if you know what I mean. But we're not going to diagnose him here. It's just kind of odd. Anyway, it's said that they were a thing, him and Rebecca, despite her marriage to a very wealthy plastic surgeon. This was all supposed to be 
a big hush secret uh, down on the DL. We weren't supposed to be knowing about it or talking about it, that they were romantically involved after his divorce and while she was still married to the doctor. However, once the trial started against Rebecca, there really was no choice but to talk about it. And you'll see why in a moment. So the trial has started for Rebecca and we're gonna cover a few important things about it, despite this continuing as of now. There doesn't seem to be any live footage or cameras of this trial or in the courtroom. So this is all gathered off very public media and news. But what I do know is the prosecution rests and the defense as of now today, February 13th of 2024 is beginning their side. Because this is a whole story and we really wanna cover all sides of the case, like especially the defense, we're actually gonna do a part two to this video. So this is part one. We're gonna talk a little bit about the back and the forth regarding the preliminary hearings, prior court visits, and where we stand with the prosecution and kind of what went down so far. So going in, prosecutors say while having cocktails with Scott Erickson, her boyfriend, they were together joined with retired baseball player Royce Clayton. Royce Clayton testified as well, and he had to, and this is why. He said, Scott had two drinks, but Rebecca only had one. Nevertheless, Rebecca went on to speed dangerously and allegedly crashed into the boys as they crossed True Info Canyon Road alongside their mother. The black box data from Rebecca's Mercedes showed that she was speeding up to 81 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour lane. She was speeding that fast on a quiet residential street and she barely braked before two strikes with small objects. And this is a testimony according to a crash investigator. Rebecca's vehicle had been disabled by a system override after her airbag deployed following a collision. Her car coasted to a stop about a third mile from the crash scene where Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies found her alongside her SUV, which obviously had visible front end damage. So it was the car that stopped itself, not Rebecca. And that would go back to why Nancy, the victim's mother, would say, you know what, I saw the black car go past, I heard something when it was time for the white car to pass and nobody stopped. And that's because that's true. Rebecca didn't stop. The car stopped itself. Now, because the Mercedes actually coasted to a stop because that's how the car was designed, the airbag went off. So that's a big alarm for these like newer, nicer vehicles. It also dialed out for an emergency, allegedly. So it reached out for emergency help seeing as to how the car sensed that it was wrecked. She ended up telling the operator, I was driving down the road and all of a sudden my airbag exploded. So the 911 operator on the line with Rebecca asked, did you hit a person? And Rebecca replied, no. This is truly important. Remember that. No, I didn't. That's what she's saying. I don't know why my airbag went off. Weird, right? Rebecca repeatedly asked about the children and learning that they had gotten hurt. And one of the first things that she allegedly said was, my husband, he's Dr. Peter Grossman. He runs the Grossman Burn Foundation. He can help them. Now, before we get all warm and fuzzy about that offer, like, oh, what an empath you know, wow, that's so nice uh, for her to offer assistance to someone that might be hurt. Just hang on, okay? Like that's something else to remember. So hold that thought. A breathalyzer at the scene of the incident showed Rebecca to have a blood level from alcohol of 0.75. However, they ended up warranting her to go to the hospital and take a blood test. And that actually ended up coming back as 0.08 and the legal limit 
is 0.08 here in California. Now there was quite a bit of back and forth and speculation on uh, her behavior when it was time to blow into her test. They were saying that she was blowing really light. She really wasn't like giving it her best shot to give it the best blow that she could. And they actually had someone that specializes in those blow tests come forward and say, you know what, don't worry about that. Uh, this is pretty accurate. This, these tests are designed for this purpose. I mean, we have people like this all the time. <laughs> they think they can beat out the system. The system's designed to beat them. So even though she breathed uh, a lot more lightly and her blood level was less alcohol than when they actually drew her blood three hours later, uh, that's pretty typical regardless. The other reason why her blood alcohol content would end up going higher, the other reason to back that is because um, as time goes on, they had another specialist say that uh, it's pretty normal for the alcohol to hit as time goes on. So that was also another reason why she had a different level when she tested through her blood versus a blow test. And in case you're wondering, she was not charged for a DUI. Here's the kicker. She actually tested positive for Valium, which is a psychoactive that acts on the central nervous system and is a depressant just like alcohol. So basically, if you pop pills and you drink, then it can really amplify the effects of alcohol when you take that drink. Usually that's pretty much why most prescriptions say do not take when drinking. It's been a hot debate whether she was impaired or not. And I'll say what I'm thinking about that near the end. I'll say why this case is based on speed alone and not so much this, but why is this so important? We'll get into that in a minute. Going forward, a detective by the name of Detective Michael Takix said people who have one beer plus Valium, that can actually seem like five beers. And so now you're getting the idea of a cocktail with Valium. Oh my God, you know what? Like that's, she, it, she could have been impaired very easily. However, an investigator also had to testify and say, you know what? Uh, we didn't find a pill bottle anywhere. We didn't find Valium on her anywhere. It wasn't in her purse. It wasn't in her Mercedes. This stuff can be in your system for some time once you take it. So they couldn't really prove, or as of now, they can't or haven't proved that she took it the night of. It matters because of what happened. It does, um, like her choices and speeding like that and not being completely aware of what happened. That's really weird. And so that's where this comes into play. However, it, I don't think it really matters if you find a pill bottle or not because a lot of times people can take that stuff at home. You just pop a pill and then you get in your car and you go to lunch or dinner and you can have a drink. So I know that they had to check and I know they had to report hey, we didn't find this, but it doesn't mean that she didn't actually irresponsibly take that before she went to dinner with her boyfriend and uh, decide that she was going to speed and kill some kids. Dr. Michael Takix continued that he was able to see signs of impairment in Rebecca when he did conduct the field sobriety test administered after the crash. Although the test allegedly had some errors. Recently, it's come out that the LA County Sheriff's Deputy Michael Kelly, he admitted under cross-examination by the defense that there were errors made in administering her test. He also said that the signs of impairment were that she kept her eyes open on the finger to nose test, that she took nine steps instead of eight, and that she was definitely swaying when she was asked to do the one leg stand test. So, you know, that kind of backs the point that she didn't seem all there. And again, we'll get into more of why that matters here in a minute. Also, there have been texts that Rebecca had sent her friend, Rose Wiltshire. Rose Wiltshire had to take the stand and testify, by the way. In these texts, Rebecca said, I do take accountability. I turned my head to the right, probably one or two more seconds longer than I should when I saw a woman on rollerblades to the right side of my car, jumping. She said at the time of the crash that she noticed Nancy, the victim's mother, was wearing skates as she began to cross the road. Her youngest son, Zachary, was next to her on his scooter. Her older son, Mark, was on a skateboard and Jacob was also wearing skates. And the two boys were ahead of their mother when they were going on the crosswalk. So 
Rebecca is kind of texting her friend like, I don't get it. Like she says, I wasn't texting or reaching for anything. I was really surprised that I saw this woman crashing to the right side of the car on rollerblades. Like I had no clue what was going on. You know, when she's saying that, you kind of have to remember like she's going really fast. She's going faster than you should on a freeway in a residential area. Okay, so for her to say, I don't really get it. I don't know why that woman was crashing. Like, really? I mean, that must have been a very long view of seeing a mother, you know, like you're looking to the right. Somebody's crashing while you're going that speed. I mean, it's just, it's pretty insane how she's sort of not taking accountability. And there's almost this victimization in her messaging to her friend. Like, I don't get it. I mean, I take accountability that maybe I looked too long. But other than that, well, other than that, you know, two kids passed away. But, you know, other than that. Now, what can we expect from defense? defense is this. Rebecca's defense by the name of Tony Busby will present a striking new allegation that states it was actually her boyfriend, Scott Erickson, who is responsible for this tragedy. They're gonna run with the idea that Rebecca's vehicle was not the first to hit the brothers. He has repeatedly said that Scott Erickson's black Mercedes, which sped through the intersection ahead of Rebecca, Rebecca's struck both children, throwing Jacob to the curb and Mark high into the air before he landed in the path of Rebecca's SUV as she crossed second. So that's what to expect from defense, that the boy Mark landed on top of Rebecca's car and that she had possibly driven Mark quite a distance before he ended up at his landing spot where he was discovered deceased. Jeffrey Mudert, a traffic accident reconstruction expert, however, has testified no way did Scott hit them first. Two witnesses traveling in another vehicle testified during a preliminary hearing that they ended up seeing Scott's SUV speeding ahead of Rebecca's. Jake Sands, being one of them, testified that the black SUV, Scott Erickson's, approached the crosswalk first. What he saw was that the driver of the black SUV tapped his brakes and that it swerved around the family right before Rebecca's Mercedes came into play. Another witness by the name of Yasmin said that the white Mercedes, driven by Rebecca, was unable to avoid the boys and that they were further on the street as she sped straight into the crosswalk. Yasmin does not recall seeing the second child get hit, but she said, yeah, that vehicle, that white vehicle hit the first child. So the unfortunate thing is this is definitely Rebecca's trial because Scott actually got dismissed. He was charged originally with a misdemeanor count of reckless driving, but then the judge ordered him a while back that he needed to make a public service announcement about the importance of safe driving. I, I don't know how to feel about that. Yet, Rebecca's defense stand firm on their allegations against Scott. Tony Busby alleges that a sheriff's investigator never checked Scott Erickson's vehicle after the fatal crash and they only took his word for it in a phone interview. And he told them, yeah, I was driving a 2007 Mercedes SUV. Rebecca's defense called it to the LA County Superior Court Judge Joseph Brandolino's attention that Scott Erickson produced that vehicle for examination in a civil litigation after the deadly crash. Yet, the lawyer then showed a photo of a 2016 Mercedes AMG that Scott was allegedly driving the night the boys were killed. I know, right? It, this is getting crazy, but I mean, he was let off. So what now? So this is part of where the defense is coming off. Like they're saying that they're gonna be able to prove that Scott was involved in this. Now, going back to proving that, you know, regardless of what he was driving, that it was Rebecca, an accident reconstruction construction expert said, no, a single vehicle high speed crash had led to the boy's injury. This guy's name is John Grindy and he pointed at a photo of Rebecca Grossman's SUV while testifying. The front end damage was consistent with two 
impacts. When the SUV hit Mark in specifics, the impact happened near the middle of the front of the vehicle. The force had pushed the lip of the hood back several inches and damaged the grill. And that Jacob was indeed struck close to the front passenger side. John Gritty would say, hey, no other vehicles were involved. However, when defense for Rebecca ended up cross-examining John, there had been a big mistake made. Sheriff's personnel had photographed pieces of debris on the road, but they had not collected or booked it for evidence. Now, as I wrap this up, I just wanted to throw in why the impairment, you know, really matters. The fact that Rebecca says that she did not know that she hit something when clearly the front of her vehicle is damaged. That's why they started looking into, well, how much did you drink? And if you only had a cocktail and you're blowing under the limit, what else did you have in your system? Like, were you crossfaded? Did you, you know, take that pill before you went to dinner? Like, they were really speculating on that because she just seemed like she was not taking responsibility at all. Like, it wasn't me. I, you know, it wasn't me. She probably is taking responsibility for the speeding, and I've heard that she is, but we, you know, I don't have proof of that as of yet, but we're gonna get into more of, like, what she's thinking, and I'm curious if she's gonna testify. I don't think so, because it's a fragile subject. I'm not necessarily saying that she didn't have a heart, but man, when the tire meets the road, you get to know who you're dealing with for real. Let's talk a little bit about Rebecca's character outside of kind of what we've already seen. During a pre-trial hearing in the year of 2023, so just last year, Rebecca was said to have arrived late to court. And Nancy was there, the mother of the victims, and man, she just felt completely slapped in the face by this gesture. She said it was callous of her to do that. Nancy also said deep in her grief, some folks don't understand that there are people involved, feelings involved. I see their friends graduating and I'm just here at a courthouse hoping for justice. Now get this. This is the tea. Jurors heard from a California Highway Patrol officer about a time when he warned socialite Rebecca Grossman, who's on trial for murder, about the dangers of speeding all the way back in 2013. He gave her a ticket. His name is Robert Leffler. And under oath, he's like, she was doing 92 miles an hour on the freeway. She apologized. She said her husband had to go into work and that she was dashing to get her kids. But after giving her a ticket, he informed her then, hey, just, you know, reminder, speeding is very dangerous. She said, he testified. She was frustrated to a degree where she said she hoped that I don't need the services of the burn center in the future. Now, her lawyer got really mad. That's a pretty heartfelt defense. Oh, wow. You know, her lawyer turned into a bulldog and he's like, oh, are you kidding me? Of all the people you arrest, you remember that? And the cop's like, yeah, actually I do. Yeah, I haven't forgot it. I knew exactly who she was when I saw her hit the media for speeding. Yep. So damn. I mean, what do you guys think about Rebecca Grossman? How do you feel about learning that she uses the burn center every time she's caught in some legal thing? Like how she used it in 2013 against the officer that rightfully so gave her a ticket because she was speeding and then she was flirty speeding or whatever she was doing that night with her boyfriend as a married woman. And then uh, she used the burn center to say that my husband can help these kids. This is what the mother Nancy's talking about in my opinion. Like you really just think that we could just, you know, money can buy this back. You really think that your burn center can fix all of this? You really think that? You really think you can show up late to court and that it's gonna be okay because it's a legal thing for you that your husband's probably gonna pay off? That, that you have an attorney and I, I don't get to see my kids and you're a mother? You good with that? I completely understand Nancy's frustration. I mean, outside of the pain of losing her kids, just how this woman is just behaving about all of this. And oh my God, can we just talk about how she's turning on her boyfriend right now? Man, oh my God. And then like, I can't forget this part, how she is looking when she goes to court. Like right now, she looks like a victim. Like she, she looks like she's going to church. But before that, she looked like a powerhouse. You know, she looked like a, a real woman's woman. 
Like, I don't know, man. Maybe this guy, Scott, and her deserved each other. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's weird and sick. And allegedly her husband is standing by her. He's in all the pictures. He's walking next to her. So, wow, what does this look like? You know, like I live here in California. Like I don't want to, I would never like go pay that guy to help me. And I probably need a lot of help, but let that, that's another story for another time. I just, I wouldn't want to support that family right now. The kids and everything, it's just sad, my God. So we're gonna do a part two here shortly. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Till then, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hug your kids a little tighter. Be so careful. Let's learn from this some way, somehow. All right, guys, much love. See you next time, hopefully for a part two. Otherwise, we might have to do a story in between depending on how long the trial is and what news we can gather, but there's definitely gonna come another follow-up video. Take care, guys. I'm Chelsea J. Crime Light out. Blood stains, the charm remains. Poor bastard that blew out his brains. I say it all, it's routine to me. Crime scene.